is Trisha with Insectopia, and we are going to be looking at an ichneumonid wasp today, so um, I'm pretty excited to kind of walk you, ladies and gentlemen, through that. I know that there are a good number of you out there who really do love sketching and checking out different types of wasps, so I thought that this one would be a lot of fun for us. It is... Um, October 30th, which is wild. We've been doing Inverttober every day of the month of October, but there is only one day left after today. Um, I was at an Eagle game, Eagles game a little bit earlier, and you can tell I might be losing my voice just a little bit, but we're still here to have a good time. We're still here to sketch. Um, so today we are doing, um, just a basic insect illustration, um, <clears throat> pencil and microscope, and then, um, tomorrow I'm gonna be, tomorrow at 10 p.m., I'm gonna be doing a collection tour. So you'll be able to, we're gonna go through all of my collection, we're gonna look at all of the different insects that I have, um, we're gonna talk about them, kind of where I collected them, all those types of things. It is six drawers worth of bugs. So, yeah, it's six drawers. It'll take us a little bit of time, I think, but it's worth it. It's gonna be a good time. All right. Whew. I, uh, I took a power nap before coming on the live stream because the Eagles, uh, you know, the, the tailgating was a, was a lot and had a good time and all those things, so. Yay! Alrighty, so, uh, let's see. We are looking at this absolutely gorgeous ichneumonid, and you may notice that the, um, let's see, get that behind again. Um, you may notice that the pin looks like it's a lot further away than the wasp if you're looking kind of at the degrees of focus, and you would totally be right. Um, this wasp is not pinned through its body. Um, this is, this ichneumonid wasp is actually pointed. So if I was to turn it around to the other side, you could see that there's a small piece of paper glued to the right side of the thorax. And then that piece of paper is, um, pinned through. And that's because this guy would have been a little bit more difficult to get a pin through without damaging any of the characteristics. And so it's just pointed. Now, our specimen also is on our microscope, and it, its entire body fits underneath our microscope. So the other thing that I can do is I can measure it directly on here. So I'm not sure if you want to go to the end of the abdomen or the end of the ovipositor. All right, so I'm going to go from the end of the abdomen, and then um, if any of you out there would like a measurement, we can do them both if we want. That's fine. So from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, our specimen is 1.53 centimeters, 1.53 centimeters. And if we did that same thing, if we started at the head, but instead ended at the end of the abdomen, it's looking like it's 1.22 centimeters. All right, so we got our measurements down. I know there are a number of you who like those. Now, let's see. So, Achneumonidae is the family for this wasp. Ichneumonidae is the scientific name or the, the family name for this wasp, but the common name for these are just 
Eichneumon wasps. So if you take off the IDAE, you get its actual, you get its common name too. Um, some insects are like that. Uh, and sometimes we actually turn the scientific names into a common name, kind of, or we kind of shorten the scientific names. So like, for instance, fireflies, we'll sometimes call them lampyrids, even though their full family name is lampyridae. Or, um, coccinellids, sometimes ladybugs are coccinellidae. But sometimes we just say that there are coccinellids. So if you're talking to an entomologist and instead of using the scientific, the full scientific name, sometimes we'll drop the I-D-A-E or the A-E at the end of them. Just fun. What a beauty. Glad you pushed the time back. Perfect. That makes me happy. Um... So I pushed the time back, does that, and that means that Susan can make it. Yahoo! All right. So I've got my Ichneumon wasps hanging out here. Let's see. I'm trying to decide if I was going to sketch it on my paper this way or if I was going to turn it. I think I want to turn it so that it, I can sketch it a little bit larger. Yeah, that's going to happen. Cool. I do absolutely love this, um, I do absolutely love this wasp. I love that the, uh, I love that the tibia and the tarsal segments are striped. Um, I also think the fact that the hind legs are really long makes the wasp look kind of cute. Um, Ichneumonids, um, are the largest family of, it's, they're definitely the largest family of wasp. And I think they might be the largest family of insect. They're uh, definitely in the top five. All right. So um, we've got, yeah, so there are a whole, whole lot of ichneumonid wasps. They're mostly all parasitoids. <clears throat> um, they're mostly parasitoids. So they're going to be laying their eggs in um, beetle grubs, in in, well, pretty much in everything. In caterpillars, in a lot of immature insects. Um, there are also a number of ichneumonids that are gall wasps and that are going to grow inside of plants. But they're always, they pretty much are always using another organism to survive and thrive. Um, ichneumons are. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us a uh, and get us a, a light sketch started of this wasp now. So up here in the top of the head, and and just like you guys know, we are going to be um, we're gonna I'm gonna give you a minute to get this guy's kind of full body and the ratios kind of figured out, and then we're gonna zoom in and check out all the the detailed characteristics of our specimen. So let's see. I want to start it down here. Um, our head is going to be kind of almost pointed in the back and then rounded in the front. Um, so I'm going to start with a shape that almost that looks a little bit like this for my head. I probably am going to be changing that and modifying it as we go, but that's what I'm starting with. Now, our thorax... Um, it starts with essentially a straight vertical line. You see that? It's got, it's, it's very, very sharp on the front. Um, and then we're going to round it back. <laughs> Something like that. All right, so the bottom of my body I'm going to mostly do in this 90 degree angle. That's going to change a little bit when we go and look at it, but that's the shape I want to start with. And then an arch from the top to the bottom because we're going to be now starting our abdomen here. And let's see, our abdomen <clears throat> is connected to the bottom.
And this is our first kind of light sketch, so we may not need to count all of the abdominal segments, but I want to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. My guess is that it's eight, but we are going to be zooming in and, and sketching them a little bit better. So I'm going to go ahead and give my, um, my wasp eight segments. One, two, three, four, five. And this is also going to change and be modified, but I want to get us a basic start. So we've got these um, kind of long, thin, eight abdominal segments, and then we have the what we call the ovipositor, um, spelled this way. We have the ovipositor, and that is way back here. This is an egg-laying device, which means that our specimen today is female. Now, it almost looks like the ovipositor comes all the way back to maybe the third abdominal segment and kind of um, changes the shape of the abdomen from here. So I'm just going to go ahead and give us... Some uh, shape that looks like that. There we go. And then I'm gonna, we're going to get these wings in. Now, <coughs> <coughs> our defining characteristic on our wings, or our defining characteristic for ichneumonid wasps is on its wings. So let's see. Um, the wings are going to start, you can imagine them kind of starting at the end of the pro, um, the end of the pronotum and the end of the mesonotum. Um, the end of the first segment on the thorax and the second segment. And so when you are, um, so when you're trying to kind of pick where your wings are going to be starting, you can kind of divide your thorax into thirds and then put the wing connections on the end of the first third and the end of the second third is what I was trying to describe. So we've got that happening. Our wings are kind of triangular and the first pair are much larger than the second pair. So we're going to be taking this out. It looks like our wings, if we were um, drawing them at the same angle, let's see, oopsies, don't go over there, Terry. All right, so we've got here that maybe the wings, the wing tip is going to come about here, and then... Terry out of the way for everybody. There we go.
that's better. So we're trying to get this this um this kind of angled tip where it comes to a shoulder here and then it goes out because this shoulder is also going to annotate where our hind wing um comes out to. So if we start here for our hind wing now, our wings can pretty much connect here and then they're going to be coming down from right about here and then going back. And a lot of times the hind wing also has an angle and you can use this angle from our front wing to kind of align the hind wing. Um... <clears throat> Thinking back, I'm realizing that every beer wasp seems to have basically the same shape of wings. The one big and the one small and basically the same shape. Yeah? You're right. <clears throat> this bug did not skip leg day. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, the, um, the femur and the coxie are both fairly, um, they're both, uh, they're globular, I guess we could say. You're right. I think that the, that many wasps, be, um, bees, wasps, and ants, admittedly, they all have very similar basic, they all have very similar wing shapes, um, with this kind of triangular tip. I'm not sure if there's a reason for that. All right. Our first leg is going to go forward, but I was hoping not to let it go so far forward that it interrupted the head. Um, so I'm going to try and keep my front leg approximately that size, it looks like. And then our middle legs and our hind legs are going to be coming off of the back. And they do... Um, and they do have, uh, and they do point backward. So the coxie are actually orange and bulbous and away from the body. So instead of just drawing our hind legs this way, I would, I, we want to get also a segment for the coxie that goes down first. And that's going to give you kind of the, the nice length that, um, in legs that our friend has. And we'll be talking about that when we zoom in, too. So then... We've got that big orange coxie, and then a femur, and a tibia. And these are just my super light sketches. I'm going to be fixing these. But I think that is going to be my goal for the legs, is to keep them kind of long. And I'm going to let them drop, but I'm not going to let them drop as far as this specimen's legs has. All right, perfect. So I think I've got the, uh, the beginning outline of our wasp done fairly, fairly well. So we're going to be zooming in to the, we're going to be zooming into the head. Do, 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 do. Oh, um, uh, Susan says that she missed the beginning. Did you say what this wasp specifically parasitizes? No, I did not. Because I'm not sure what this wasp, wasp parasitizes. Um, because I would have to know what species it is to know what it was parasitizing. Or I would have had to, like, collected it directly off of its host. And um, I believe this wasp just came to my light. Now, I was saying earlier that, um, that ichneumonid... Uh, ichneumonid wasps 
are going to be the essentially the largest family of wasps that there is. And so uh, they are very difficult to identify down to species because of that. Look at those mouth parts, though. She's got some palps. Well, I mean, she's got a pretty cool head, as it turns out. She's got um, interesting antennal segments. She does have three ocelli up here on the top of her head um, in that triangular shape that we see regularly. So one, two, three little ocelli. And if we look all the way down here, she has pale, almost yellow or beige-colored mouth parts. Those are labial palps. And she's got something hanging out right here on her head. And I'm not sure what exactly that would have been. It almost looks like she just has a little bit of dust on her. But it's the same color as her labial palps. So I'm not sure. Um, if you missed the beginning, you may also have missed her size. I believe from her front of her head to the back of her tail, she was approximately 1.52. Oops. 1.52 or 1.53 um, centimeters long. <clears throat> All right. Oh, my eraser flew away. All right. Oh, well. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We got water. She has golden mouth fingers. Yes. Whatever she eats, it goes out in style. Yeah, whatever it is. Exactly. Um, all ichneumonids are parasitoids, um, but they parasitize all different types of things. So beetle grubs, caterpillars, immature nymphs of all sorts, grasshoppers, um, but they also are going to be parasitizing plants sometimes too. So you have ichneumons that are also gall wasps. Um, so there's a huge variety of things that they could be feeding on. All right. Now with our head, I want to get our shape kind of figured out. Um, we had this very strong angle up here on the top and I like the size of our head, but we just have to kind of round that out a little bit. Um, so we can go ahead and get that angle down. Now, from the top of the head to the front up here, they, she does have this little, like, angle on the front of her face, um, and that angle is where the antenna come off. So if you go about halfway down, you're going to want it to kind of slant forward like this for the first half of the head, and then it can, <clears throat> and then it can round back down, um... But we're going to want it to, it kind of rounds back in. Let me, uh, I've got an idea. There we go. Now it's a little bit closer to the screen. So it kind of rounds back in, and then you have this region, oops, right about there. That's going to be where all of it, her mouth parts are. <clears throat> All right, so that's going to be our kind of overall head shape here. Um, we're probably also going to zoom in even closer so that we can add detail to the mouth parts. Um, but let's first, I'm going to put these ocelli up here at the top. I just have the space for the one that's close and then the one that's on the middle. Um, the one that's on the other side is not going to be visible. All right, and then we have our compound eyes. Now our compound eyes 
Um, they don't go all the way to the back of the head. They do stay pretty close, but they round out to, to almost the, all the way to the front of the head up here. So let's see if we can get a shape. Yeah, something like that, where our, um... Our, eye, our compound eyes are going to take up most of the head, but we are also creating this little um, forward region in the head here. You can almost imagine this point um, where the head starts to narrow as kind of shaded and dark. All right. Um, now we're going to get in here and we're going to cross hatch in the eye to make it look realistic. You know it's one of my favorite things to do. Give our insect, give our wasp some life, some character. All right, now we have our antenna. And our antenna, I believe, are... One of my antennas broken and I didn't know it. Darn it. Oops, excuse me. <clears throat> That's got to be from the insect. Or from what it parasitizes. I'm going to look at that under the microscope because I don't know exactly what I'm seeing yet. Oh! Alright, I'm going to be turning the head. We're going to look at it from the top because I want to show you what these antenna what these antennal segments are doing. We have not seen antennal segments like this yet. Let's see if you can see it from this angle. Not as well. Darn it. I guess this is going to be the best angle to see how the um, how the escape and the pedestal of our wasp antenna look. So keep in mind that <coughs> um, our antenna segments they go escape, pedestal, and then uh, flagellum. And the scape is that first segment of the antenna, the pedestal is the second, the flagellum is the third segment of the antenna. Now, if we look right about here, this is our first segment of the antenna. It is the scape. It's coming out from the head, but um, it doesn't have an, a connection that's straight across. Um, it's why it's taller on the center of the body and it's shorter on the edge of the body and then it connects it kind of this diagonal. So where you see, um, where you see, uh, here, that is actually, this is that U is the edge of the scape, um, because it connects tall in the center and then short on the edge and both of them do this um, away from the center of the body and then your pedestal comes out from that and comes to about here and then your flagellum starts and that's going to be the the remainder of the segments Evea, you said you love the drawings that I put on the Nature Journal page? The ones of the birds? That makes me happy, because I was trying, I tried so hard. I, um, but 
But um, we were only out. We were only out for about like an hour and a half, and I feel like um, I'm gonna practice my birds a little bit because I would love to. Oh, thank you. There were a couple of them I was pretty happy with. I think the chickadee was my best one, or the heron. I uh, I liked both of those. <clears throat> they were so sketchy, you know. All right. So let's see, we're going to get that, so we're going to be trying to do something like that where our antennal segment, the first one, instead of coming up and being flat, you're going to have this U in here that will show the second one. Aw, that makes me ha that. Thank you so much, Avea. Yeah, I um, and that's the thing is, I'm just now starting to learn birds, so it's you know, it's it's more of an exploratory process than it is like um, being having having perfect per um, perfect artistry at the moment. It's just trying to learn about them and and sketching what I see and. Yeah, and I feel like sometimes people are afraid of sharing. Um, I also feel like people are sometimes afraid of, of sharing their sketches if they are not, um, like, perfectly well, like, well done or if they're, if they're not finished. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of also, my, one of my other goals was just being like, hey, guys. It's okay that your that your sketches start off kind of looking like this, you know. All right, so I was trying to get an idea of the length of some of these antennal segments, um, and what I'm coming up with is that the third antennal segment, or yeah, the third antennal segment, or the first segment of the flagellum is the longest. It's this one here, and it goes from here to about here. That's uh, probably two or three times the length of the scape and the pedestal combined. But then all of the remaining segments, they get smaller and smaller. Um, so it looks like... <clears throat> Ah, uh, a lot of segments. I was trying to count them, but I got to something like 35 and then miscounted. So with this guy, I'm just going to take his antenna and I'm going to pull him back like this. And it's just going to go up and over its, over its body rather than going forward where I don't have any room on the paper. And because it's not going to be interacting with the legs, I'm just going to sketch them now. So getting that first um, segment of the flagellum that's nice and long. And then just um, getting the, remaining, the remainder ones. Ugh. You know what? Many of the segments are... Um, they almost look like they're filiform or they're straight across. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do it like this. Yeah. And then I'm going to give all these crosses like this. Because once you get to the end, there are many small segments. They start off pretty large, but then by the time you get to the end of these antenna, they're really thin and small. And so that's kind of how I would like to sketch it today. Um, it starts off with the first handful of them being fairly angulate, or you can see the edges and in between them. But then once it gets to the end, it's pretty straight. Let's see. I want to 
wanted to come back in and darken this for you guys. straight with a little flange at the end and and yes one of my antennae um <coughs> one of my antennae broke off but this one that's close we can see all the, the entirety of all right now it's time to zoom in on those mouth parts and see if we can see anything fun there um i personally would like to look at our friend head on and I think that that's going to be easier for us to see the mouth parts, too. Oh, and this is a really good angle to show you what I mean by pointing. This is what a pointed specimen looks like. So there's actually something that we call a point, um, like a, there's like a point press where um, instead of it being like a hole punch with a perfect circle, um, you punch out points and then you take a little bit of glue and you glue the specimen. Um, you put a little bit of glue on the point and you just glue the right side of the specimen to the point and then the pin goes through the point and that way you don't ruin any of the characteristics on your specimen. This is done for a lot of very small insects if the pin is going to be too big. Um, it's also done for, um, any and all ants. Ants are supposed to be, all of them are supposed to be pointed. I have a number of ants that I just pinned right through the body because I was, you know, saving a little bit of time for myself, but I know, I do know that they're supposed to be pointed. Like, if you talk to a form, uh, what do we call them, a formicologist? Somebody who studies ants? Um, they'll tell you that all ants should be, um, pointed rather than pinned. All right, let's zoom in on the head. Also, from the front, we might be able to see what that fluff is. Maybe not. Just fluff. All right, let's zoom in on those mouths. Come on. The thing about having an insect that's so little is that you move it only an itty bitty bit and it moves all the way across the screen. There we go. You know, I think some of our mouth parts are going to be actually easier to see from the side, but I wanted to look at these these golden labial pelps. <coughs> um, I was also, I was hoping that we were going to be able to see the mandibles from here. But I don't think that we can. So let's go ahead and draw our palps. Um, these look like they are one, two, three segmented palps. Mm-hmm. 
to get them about the right size is another thing. I think that that's going to be about right. So we've got those two palps here, but I was trying to see about... It's really just those palps, huh? So this is what it looks like from the side. Oh, wait a minute. These palps may not be three segmented. We could see three segments from the front, but when we turn it in the back, we actually see more. They come down from the bottom, from the head, and they have this triangular, they have a very small kind of triangular segment, and then <clears throat> one segment that goes forward, one segment that goes backward, and then three more. So it looks like five or six segments. That's a whole lot more than three. But it's, uh, palps were pushed backwards, so from the front we couldn't see those last ones. So that's what my singular palp looks like, and I think I'm just going to leave the one so that it doesn't get confusing. Plus, um, I'm drawing the lateral view anyway, so um, I'm taking the artist's choice of just drawing one rather than drawing the one on the other side too. Trixie Wasp! Exactly! How dare it! It's not allowed to fool us! Me no like Trixie Wasps. So when I hear the word Trixie, I think of Lord of the Rings. I think of the Hobbit going, Trixie Hobbits. region here and there are a couple of characteristics that I kind of want to start by pointing out. Um, we can see the thing that we call the tagula. Sorry, my words, I'm gonna fix these words. I don't like when they do that. They, they like auto change, auto fill to the size of the box. Sometimes it's it sometimes it decides to change its format just like that. It drives me up a wall. There we go. So, um, we can see the tegula, which are the shoulder pads of our wings. They sit right about here and they are also golden. Um, we have a we have a plate back here on the top of our thoracic region. Um, most of the thorax is this dark black color. It does have fine light golden or light orange hairs. And then you can see our legs are these beautiful orange colors. Um, if we look right about here, I believe that the coxy of the first leg is black. Nope. 
it's orange too right here so this is the caxi of the first leg it's orange and then there is a um trochanter in there and then the femur the tibia and the tarsi and then when we're looking back here where our middle and our hind legs go the uh this part right here that's actually our coxy or that's our hip bone and then we've got the trochanter here and then the femur tibia tarsi all those segments I was reading your mind then. Oh, I love it. Okay. All right, we've gotten a little bit of a view of all over our thorax now. So now I've got to pick one view and stick with it so that we can sketch it together. And I'm thinking that I want to zoom in, but I'm not going to focus too much on the legs just yet, just the body. And I might even zoom in so that we can put the, so that we can look at defined characteristics on the tegula. But right now we'll start here. So, um, when we are sketching our thorax, where I want to start is I do want to make sure that this line up here in the front is fairly strong, and, um, even when we zoom in, we can see that that is a fairly vertical straight line, but I'm not going to take it as far down as I did because I do want it to kind of angle in a little bit. Also, I want to... <laughs> I want to have a separation for my coxie in the front, for my pro coxie is what we would call it. <laughs> the first coxie is the pro coxie. I, uh, I drew this like, I drew this cheater thing for my students, um, and it might help you too. So if you've got the head, the thorax, and then the abdomen, your first segment of the thorax is pro, and then you have meso, and then you have meta, and then anything on the top we call the notum, and then on the bottom we call it the sternum. So you can say the pronotum is the top of the first segment of the thorax, or the metasternum is the bottom of the third segment of the thorax. So um, that might help you. I don't know. Um, my, that, it helped my students kind of visualize it. And then you know where the pro leg is. It's the first one. Or the meso leg. It's the second one. Right? All right. So we are going to round out up here in the top. Now, uh, the top of our thoracic region is just a little bit after where the wing connects. So I'm going to give myself a little mark there where I know that that's kind of where I want it to arch up to and then come back down. <clears throat> and I'm going to, let's see, uh, I can see it, but I want to show it to you. The end of this plate comes about right here. So it's like a cap on the top, and it ends right about here, and then you've got um, a number of other uh, sternites coming down. <clears throat> All right, so we've got like that, and then I want to make it needs to not be so low. <clears throat> So we've got this top part on here now. Um, and then we are also going to want, <clears throat> down here at the front, we want to add our, our pro coxy. So that's going to be an angle in. But then it, our coxy is going to be kind of this triangular shape like this. 
And our femur is going to connect off of it. Um, we have a good amount of space between the front leg and the middle leg. I'm just going to give us that arch here. <clears throat> and our middle leg is connected to the coxy also. And the coxy is coming down. So I gave it coming up like this, but I'm not going to sketch that um, with a solid line. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to follow this down. And I'm going to erase the top part. <clears throat> it's just easier for me to sketch the uh, the whole circle. Now, keep in mind that the coxie is a whole other color. It's a whole other segment. So you can go ahead and, and divide it off there. Um, I'm not going to draw our femur and our tibia just yet. I want to go back and... I want to look at the shape of our of our metacoxy. How come so many insects have a nice big pronotum, but no one has a nice impressive mesonotum covering everything else? You know what? I'm not sure. Every insect just just decides to have um, their pronotum that covers everything. It's the first segment of the thorax, so it has the ability to expand up to protect the head or back to protect the thorax. Also, the... Um, the first pair of wings is connected to the back side of the first segment of the thorax. So the wings are connected to the first segment. So if you had um, something on the mesonotum that was trying to protect the wings, it would almost be too late, right? Because it would be coming up from behind where the wing was starting. And I can't think of any insect that... Um, No, I can't think of any insect that has an expanded meso or metanotum. <clears throat> because those segments are generally um uh, those there's those segments are generally hidden um by the wings. And so we don't even talk about them regularly, which is why they sound like weird names to me, but they are the true words for those regions. It's just that we don't see them, and they don't have, um, so I don't generally have, like, defining characteristics that use them. <clears throat> I'm going to erase my, um, my sketch of my femur and my tibia, because I think I'm going to be changing the angles of those anyway. Now, <clears throat> our metacoxy back here is wide at the top. It's kind of, like you said, it looks bulbous. It almost looks like it's been working out. Um, so it's connected right here to the third segment of our thorax. Let's see, looks like. Looks like that. <laughs> and the trochanter is really, really easily visible. It's right there. So, if you would like the words for our legs... Don't mind me, it's going to be small because I wanted to just get them all in there. We have coxa, trochanter, fema, tibia, tarsi. So the ones that we can see here are the coxa, the trochanter, and the start of the femur. All right. Um, so let's see. We've got the side of our thorax, the, the start of our legs, which is really what I wanted to do in the first place anyway. I want to get kind of the outline taken care of. So let's see. Um, we're also going to have some segmentation inside of the thorax. So there's a plate that comes in this direction. You can, uh, we might want to... 
I don't know if I want to draw all the plates because I don't think I'm going to be able to see them all. Um... I was thinking the pronotum was covering the whole thorax on a ahemipteran or a beetle, but I just realized that the wings start behind the pronotum. Exactly! And so, um, if you're thinking about, like, a beetle, for instance, um, I'm going to draw it on this guy right here. If you're talking about a beetle, uh, we're going to do a ladybug. So we've got something that looks like this, right? Now, this up here is the pronotum, but from here to here, that's not the end of the thorax. The thorax, this is just the first segment of the thorax. And then you have a, the second segment and then the third segment. So this whole region is the thorax, and a lot of times... There you go. This whole region is the thorax, and then the abdomen are these smaller segments at the end. But in an insect like a wasp, it almost could make sense to have um, like a spine or, a, or, a, or something that come, came off the back of the thorax to protect the abdomen because they've got such thin wasp waists. I just can't think of it. I just can't think of a wasp that has that characteristic. I think Mark was telling me that each section of the thorax has a pair of legs, but only the meso and meta have a pair of wings, never the prothorax. He was telling me this while we were exploring odonates. So, he would almost be correct. Yes, um, each section of the thorax has a pair of legs, um, but the wings are on the pro and the meso, not the meso and the meta. And a lot of people can get that mixed up because it does almost look like the wings are connected to the meso and the meta, but where they are, they're actually connected to the very, very backside of the pro and the meso. Um, so sometimes people can kind of get them shifted backwards in their head a little bit, but um, we do know that the wings are always on the first and second segments. Yes, pro and meso. And I do have a dragonfly book over here. So this is um, dragonflies and damselflies of the east. wonder if what the biggest picture in here is. Oh, right. And with dragonflies, they're slanted. They have slanted segments, too, which um, can throw people off. Here. So, if we're looking at... If we're looking at an image of a dragonfly, um, yes, we can divide them off into three, but the segmentation, you see how they're the front, um, you see how the front of the thorax is kind of angled backwards? The segments on a, th on a dragonfly are also angled backwards. So even though, so if you took a line from the front leg and just did it up, you might think that the, that the first segment of the thorax is really a little triangle, where it's actually kind of a long slanted rectangle. Um, the segments, they run, they run diagonal. And I was trying to find a good, oh, this one shows it really well because the segments are striped. So you can see here 
they've got these stripes going in that direction. That's the angle of the um, of the segments. So where it may look like it's kind of further on the back, um, this is actually you'd almost have to turn it like this to make it look straight. There you go. Now the thoracic, now the thoracic segments are straight up and down. With this wasp, you can actually see clearly where the wings are attached because there are separate lumps for the three segments. True. Exactly. Someone needs to edit the Wikipedia pa page about insect wings. Does it really say that the wings are on the meso and the meta? I'd be willing to go and I'll go over there and change it if it had an incorrect information. None of these ones have front legs tucked up. Is it skimmers that mostly do that? Let me look up some skimmers. Club tails and darners and dancers and fork tails. Bluets, those are damselflies. Hawks. There's a skimmer. Oh, hey, my camera is not activated. Activate! So I guess. Hmm, none of these have the front legs tucked up, though. Is it skimmers that do that? I wonder if you're saying that the legs are tucked up when they're flying. Because when they land, I think that when they land, they use all of their legs. But that when they're flying, they tuck their legs. Yeah, I'm not sure. I thought that they landed with all three pairs of their legs. Um, but it, it, I guess it wouldn't surprise me. I would believe you if you said that your dragonflies tuck their front pair of legs. But everyone I'm looking at, wait, this one. This one lands with four legs. This is the black saddlebag. And I guess the Carolina saddlebag also. So we have found a couple of them that land with their with their um, middle and their hind legs. But the segments, um, the segments still run diagonally. I know it's totally irrelevant to this wasp, so, but yes, there we go. And you said it was a saddlebag, and this is also a saddlebag. That's fun. When did you get to, when did you sketch a, um, when did you sketch and look at dragonflies? All right, so the 
Caligula is this triangle, and it's right before that wing starts. And then we've got the wing connection. And what I'm going to do is take this, get my image a little bit further away from the camera so that we can see it a little bit better. And I um, sp did spend a good amount of time getting this shape of this wing right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to zoom out and I want to get the wing done. We started talking about the legs, but we're going to move over to the wings. We'll come back to the legs. Because I love them. So if we were going to give these wings a name of sorts, um, these would be considered... No! The words took over. <sighs> so if we were going to give these wings a name, we would consider them membranous wings. Um, because they are clear and that you can actually see the veins on them. So we would say that this wasp has four, um, has two pair of membranous wings. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and give our, and, and sketch out our, um, our wings here and our wing shape. I really liked, I thought I did all right on this. So I want to get it nice and smooth. There we go. Oh, wait a minute. It stops here. All right. So I've got that first wing and that first shape taken care of. Now our wing here. So if you remind me closer to the end of the live stream... I will go over on the Wikipedia page and I'll change it for us so that so that Wikipedia doesn't have incorrect information. Alrighty. Yay! Now um there are some there are wing venations in these wings that are important. Um, although because the wings are see-through, you might get tricked by some of the veins. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to sketch out the wing veins together. Um, because I want to make sure that we, that we know what's happening. So our first vein all the way up here in the top, we call this the costa, um, we call it the, the coastal vein, C-O-S-T-A-L. And then once you get to that darker spot there, the spot, we call it the stigma. And I believe that ye, there are also stigma and dragonfly wings. I believe that's the case. So I'm going to start with kind of giving the, uh, I'm going to start by finding the spot for my stigma. And I'm going to say that it is right about here. That's the darker spot in our wing. Now, um, the uh, the leading edge is the coastal vein, so we don't have to worry about that. Coming off from the front of our stigma, we do have this a vein that comes down like this. Um, then, coming from here to the center, It, um, our coastal vein splits right here, and I believe because it splits off of the coastal vein, we would call this the subcosta. 
Um, and then you have an anal vein, and that's this third one coming off the base, and it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to just kind of end right about there. Now, um, this one continues. Let's see. We're actually going to make it a little bit longer, I think. Yeah, that's better. All right. And then there is this little connection here between the two. Now this one moves forward and angles down towards that one. Um, but it also, it's going to split. So it not only goes down, but it's going to angle up like this. And it's going to go out. And now this, this is the important part. Because if we start from this stigma down here, and then we go out like this, and come down and over, this shape right here, that's how we know that um, this wasp is an ichneumonid wasp. Um, um, our family level... Our family level identification characteristic is right here. They have what we call a horse head in the wings. All right. It looks like a neck and a face. And that is right here. And that is our horse head. And that is our descriptive characteristic. If it has a horse head like this, we know that it is an ichneumon. Now, admittedly, because there are so many ichneumonid species out there, um, there are a handful of ichneumonids that do not have the horse head. Um, but if it does have a horse head, then you know it's an ichneumonid. Um, if it doesn't and it looks like an ichneumonid, it could be either an ichneumon or a braconid. There is no stigma in the hind wing. Let's see. I think I might have been a little bit behind on our chat, so give me a second. I have photographed dragonflies a lot, and this summer I went to an arboretum. Oh, that's so cool. You know, I actually just got a nice pair of um, binoculars at work, too, um, or at my, like, other job, um, and... I've been using them, and I think that it would be, I might end up using them also to watch dragonflies. That'll be a lot of fun. I noticed you sketched the wing veins of a wasp, but not of a dragonfly. Uh, yeah, exactly. I hope that you know why. There's no way, but okay. So every now and again, I do actually sketch the wing veins of dragonflies, but it is only specific characteristics of those wings. Um, and actually... We can get a little sidetracked. I know that you guys like it when I go on side kind of stories. So, yes, we're sketching our wasp. But I can tell you I have sketched dragonfly wing venations because um, if you're talking about dragonfly identification down to family, you're looking at different characteristics in the wings. Now, sometimes I'll, I would just kind of scribble them out, but I darken the areas that are important. Like Aeschnids, the darners, they've got these two very similarly sized triangles in their wings, whereas Cordulids or um, Skimmers have a boot in their, in their hind wings um, with these sort of shaped triangles versus the uh, Skimmers who also have a boot um, and two triangles. So we were like, you know, playing with uh, if I'm, if I'm sketching dragonfly wing venation, they look more like this than, um, than knowing every single characteristic. I'm mostly looking for the shapes in the wings that help with identification purposes. All right, 
So at the very end of our horse head, there is a um, a little itty bitty shape, and regularly this is there. Like there is regularly just this little itty bitty shape in the front of the head of the horsey. Um, now our costa continues here, and it does come here, go from here, and reconnect up in that direction. Um, up, up from the front of this, you've got a minor vein that goes to the end of the wing, and I just want to finish off, um, some of these wings, some of these veins, so one like this, and then this one that comes through. So our front wing is really the one that we pay attention to for, um, defining characteristics, but we are going to go ahead and sketch the wing veins on our hind wing too, because it'll make our sketch look nice. Although I'm not sure if we're going to be able to see them. Let me, like, well, yeah, that's going to be a little bit trickier. So I think that this is our best view that we're going to get of the hind wing because the hind wing doesn't have a whole lot of veins on it. Let's see. We know that our first wing is connecting here. Our second wing connects a little bit lower, but not as low as I have there. It's probably going to be connecting right about here. It arches up and connects in with that first wing, and then they're pretty much overlapped until you get to the end. So I'm going to erase some of these sketchy lines in here and go, whoop, break my pencil. I'm really good at that. All right. Alright, so I've got my hind wing, that outline taken care of. I do believe most of the wing veins are, there's the one that's up, on, up along the top, which we don't, which is the top of our veins, so we don't have to worry about that. It does kind of connect and create a cell here. Kind of like this, and then from the peaks... There is a vein coming off here and here, and then I believe there's another anal vein that comes just down and runs along the bottom. So that's going to be how I sketch my hind wing venation. Um, that's what I can come up with. It might not be exactly that, because um, you can see our hind wings are a little bit folded. Um, but that is, to the best of my knowledge, what I can see. And that's all that you can ask for. Very good. Demoted from the general shape and the way that it holds its abdomen. Um, Braconids and both Braconids and Ichneumonids have, can have very similar body shapes. So, um, really, if you're talking about wasps and it looks like this, it's really either going to be a Braconid or an Ichneumonid, and that's when you go to the wing venation. Although, that's not, you know, 
Uh, you can say all day long that ichneumonids have the horse heads and brachonids do not, but then there are those handful of ichneumonids that are oddballs. Although the ones that are oddballs, um, they don't have the horse head, but that's just because they don't have all of these veins. There are really, really small ichneumonids out there that just have two or three veins, so they don't even have en enough veins in their front wings to create the horse head. Um... That is amazing. I want to learn more about the differences in dragonfly wing venation. Okay, we can do that one day. We can go over the different, we can just go over the different families of dragonflies and how to identify them based on their, based on their eye placements and their and wing venation. For sure, we can do that. So I'm going to zoom in over and we're going to look at our front leg. And I might even, what I might do is I might turn the specimen so that we are looking more like at it from the front side so we can, yes, that'll be better. So that we can see more of the leg in focus at one time. This is actually also a pretty good shot of those um, palpi. Look how gold, look how pale they are. Wow. Okay. So I like this angle for sketching our front leg, or at least so that you can see all the characteristics in the front leg. Now, this triangle here, the first one that's orange right here, that's the coxie that we've already added. This triangle right here, that's your trochanter. Um, your femur goes up, your tibia comes down, and these are the tarsal segments. One, two, three. I believe that's just four. Yep. So, I've got my coxie already here, my trochanter, and, you know, a lot of this is going to go on top of itself. So, the trochanter is coming up, and it's a triangle, triangular like this. So, I'm going to get rid of that coxie, the front of the coxie, so it looks like this. All right, so then we've got the coxie, the trochanter, our femur is coming up, um... to about here. I'm actually going to make my trochanter a little smaller and my femur a little larger. That's going to be more like it. And then the tibia is going to come down. And it looks like our tibia is approximately, is a very similar length with the femur. And then we have our tarsal segments. I do believe our wasp has tibial spurs. Um, if you look over there on the right leg, you can see one, but I believe they are going to have two. Um, it looks almost like it waves also. Instead of being a straight spur, it looks like it has a little bit of an angle to it. But the spurs are going to be on the inside, so you can add it kind of here. And then um, the tarsi are going to be moving forward. <clears throat> so, one, two, three, four. And the tarsal claws. And that... And that's our front leg. All right, we are going to be moving all the way to our middle leg. Are there two tarsal claws and a dot, 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 dot pad? Yes, 
there is a pad in between the two tarsal claws, and I believe that that pad has a name. I believe it's called the pulvoli, unless that's the name for the hair in between a fly's tarsal claws. Let me look it up. I believe it's called the pulvoli. Spelled like this. Yes. So I had only really seen or talked about that pad in between the tarsal claws when I was talking about flies. And so I wanted to make sure that, you know, sometimes entomologists will use a different word for the same body part if it's a different type of insect and they can be tricky about that. So I wanted to make sure that it was the same word if it was a fly or if it was a wasp. And it is. It's called a toe bean. Sure, we can call it a toe bean. <laughs> I love that. Look at the stripies on the legs. I love it. I love it a lot. All right, so this middle leg is going to be very similar in shape. It's going to have that coxy, the trochanter, the femur, and the tibia. Although, with um, this one, I don't believe we're going to be able to see the trochanter just because I want to get my femur going up and in this direction so that it doesn't run into the hind leg as much. <laughs> so my femur is going to come... up like this and then my tibia is going to be coming back down and I'm going to try and angle it just a little bit kind of like this so that you can see um, all of the segments let's see actually that was a pretty good line that was a pretty good shot Trisha alright so I'll go ahead and then erase those and then we'll be moving all right so the trochanter is kind of hidden in there you're not going to be able to see it but you can see the coxy the femur and the tibia now the tibial spurs um i do believe that there are two of them and they if we're looking at it from this angle, honestly, it would be more like, eh. The tibial spurs go towards the body. So you, I don't think that we're going to be able to see it if we do these tarsal segments. So... Um, if one of you want to, um, if, if one of you like Susan or Avea would like to, um, volunteer to be a, um, to be a chat moderator, I do have the ability to give you the ability to moderate, moderate the chat and then you can, you yourselves can kick off all those crazy people that keep trying to spam our chat box. I try and keep up with it, but sometimes I miss them. All right. Um, let's count some tarsal segments. 
One, two, three, four. Whoa. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. It is four. That's all right. You can moderate for today. So we have four tarsal segments. One. They're nice and long and thin, and they make our legs look really long. The tarsal segments pretty much double the length of the tibia at least. So if you got the tibia here, you've got the tarsal segments and they're going to be just as long as that tibia was. The first segment looks like it's the longest. It's going to be nice, long, and thin. And then the second one is about half that. And the third one is probably the same length as the second. And the fourth one is this one that kind of comes out and it's globular a little bit because you've got the tarsal claws at the end and that toe pad. <laughs> Woohoo! Unlimited power! Perfect! Use it wisely. All right, I'm going in and shading these legs just a little bit because I do want the stripy colors in my in my sketch. So I'm just going in and kind of darkening these regions in here. You've got dark um dark dark regions at the end of every tarsal segment and then you've got one white band on the feet, on the tibia here. I'm actually just going to go ahead and do that. Yeah, that looks good. I'm happy with that. All right, let's go ahead and move to our hind legs. I love that the coxie is so bulbous in on this beat on this wasp. Alright, so I already have our coxie here, and I'm actually pretty happy with that. So we're going to continue on, and we're going to add our trochanter here. That's actually kind of long and thin. I'm going to erase this. I don't need that anymore. So we've got the rest of this happening. So let's see. Our hind leg, we've got our coxie. We're going to add our trochanter here at the end. To me, it almost looks like there's an extra segment in there that I don't really understand. So here's what I'm here's what I'm seeing. I'm gonna describe it to you, and then you can tell me if you think that it's there. Because um, normally it just goes coxie, trochanter, femur. But to me, it looks like there's a segment here and a segment here. Unless this right here is kind of an expansion of the coxie, making it kind of longer. But I think that there is... That's what it is. The coxie is actually kind of longer. This right here, this little little triangle here, that's the trochanter. That's cool. I'm going to have to change my sketch. Anyone can reuse the report feature. Very true. I think that it automatically kicks them if you report them for nudity. It like auto kicks them, but if you report for other things, sometimes the um, sometimes the the kicking off is delayed. Good morning, Chaos! We are 
are sketching an Ichneumon wasp today. And we actually spent a little bit of time checking out our wing venation too, which was pretty fun. So right now we are sketching the hind leg. Um, we are on the metafemur coming out here. And we've made all of the jokes about the fact that... Um, our wasp seems to work out. She's a... She works out! <laughs> She's got strong femurs. So that's nice and bulbous. It's bulbous here, bulbous there. And I've got... I'm going to darken the end of our femur here. And then our tibia is going to be coming down. Yeah, Susan, that is the case. It is weird, I agree. Oh my goodness! Has my hind leg always been broken or did it break during the session? The hind leg is broken. I thought that it was there. That makes me sad a little bit. All right, so we're going to leave the focus here so that we can see the tibia and the stripe on the tibia. You can also see both of the tibial spurs. So if you look at the end of the tibia of our hind leg right about here, you see one, two. Those are our two tibial spurs. Do you think if we work out hard enough, we could grow tibial spines? <laughs> I don't think that we can grow tibial spines off of our bones, but you can make them if you want. I'm sure you could build a Halloween costume. All right, so our femur is coming up. We've got a tibia that's going to be longer than the femur, and it's coming down from here. Let's see. All right, so we've got a tibia, and it's dark at the top and at the bottom, but it has that really nice light band going all the way through it. I'm going to add our two tibial spurs here, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus through the insect so that we can see the um, tarsal segments on the far leg because the ones that are close are unfortunately broken. So keep in mind that the way that the wasp is holding its leg, um, these tarsal segments are upside down. Um, so if you were going to sketch it like I'm going to be sketching where our, where I'm going to be putting the tarsal segments out in this direction, uh, you're going to want to kind of flip these upside down because this is the bottom of the foot. Um, you can see that these are the tibial spurs here. So it's kind of sitting like this with its feet up. It has one, two, three, four tarsal claws. It almost makes me want to say that it has five. What is that? Is it possible that it has five tarsal segments? Do you see this? One, two, three. Is that a little four? I think it might be. All right, so I'm gonna be drawing five tarsal segments on our hind leg. 
And I'm going to have to double check our middle leg to see if it also has um, four or five tarsal segments. Normally, tarsal formulas are the same for families of insects. And it looks like they can have a variety of four or five. So, our hind leg. I agree, that's a teeny tiny tarsal segment. Yep, yep, there. So, we've got five. So, let's see. One. One. Two, three, the little itty bitty fourth one, four, five, and the tarsal claws and the toe pad or the pulvoli. And then at the end of each one of these um, tarsal segments, it is darkened. And that fourth one is all the way darkened. Something like that. Very good. Man, it's taking us a little bit longer to sketch this wasp. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fine detail to worry about. And I think the wings also just take an extra minute. You drink too much alcohol. Yeah. I am, um, I will admit that I have had my fair share of beverages in the last, um, I've had my fair share of beverages in the last couple of days. Last night I went to a Halloween party, um, that was an absolute blast. Um, and we always end the night with karaoke, and that's always a lot of fun. So we got to sing, and we got to play, like, the scavenger hunt game, and the house is beautiful. And, you know, so I went to this Halloween party last night. And then today, I went to the Eagles game, so we tailgated. Um, so, yes, there has been a handful of beverages in my in the last couple of days. Yes, Chaos works in a bakery in Germany, and um, they are always here early, early in the morning because they're also waking up early for baking, right? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to have any um, trick-or-treaters. Uh, generally, we don't have very many trick-or-treaters to my house. But I like to have candy for the students just in case. All uh, right, so here's our abdomen, the sketched one, the one that was really light that we kind of just started. We are going to have to fix a couple of characteristics in here. You can see that there's a very strong arch on the underside of the abdomen that I didn't get to when I was sketching um, our light overview. And also, I want to make sure that that angle at the fr on the first segment of the abdomen is a little stronger. So when I'm starting my sketch here, I'm going to make a fair really like a stronger angle than I had on my first sketch so that I can um, base the rest of my abdomen off of that. And I also want to, instead of having a light sketch that goes straight, I'm actually going to just give myself a light sketch here that angles up just because I want to get the idea first. And what's cool about that is if it angles up, then we can actually make it avoid our leg. Ha <laughs> ha! And it's true to the it's true to the wasp, right? So it's not like we're just avoiding the leg altogether. Although that's kind of what it looks like, which I think is funny. All right. So our first abdominal segment. What we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in. I think we.
we counted our abdominal segments on our first time, so we're just going to, we're going to zoom in, and we're going to look at each abdominal segment individually, and then we'll add them all together. You're ahead of us, so it's Halloween morning. Spooky themed cakes. Ooh, yummy. Oh, well, hopefully, hopefully you can, um, hopefully you'll be able to spend a little bit of time hanging out with us and watching while you are baking and, um, maybe we'll help you, uh, pass the time a little bit. Alrighty, so um, I'm going to go ahead and start with this first abdominal segment. You can see that there's that strong angle here and then here, and it comes back down and around. <laughs> Something like that. All right, so I've got my first abdominal segment taken care of. Now, what I am thinking I want to do is I want to take a line from right around right around here, all right? Um, and my goal is to make the lateral line. Um, so this line that's right here in the middle, um, kind of like the closest part to us. So let's see. I'm gonna make this nice lateral line and then I'm gonna work all of my segments off of that. Um, so you can see that they're kind of narrow and thin. Um, I wanna start my next segment just a little bit underneath the last one so that there's a little bit of a ledge but not too much coming up to where I had sketched that second abdominal segment and then arching it back until we got to the lateral line and then down and as I move forward I'm going to be erasing that central line but that's how I'm going to be. So you see how I, I, I can kind of arch it backwards and then go down? And that's going to give us that kind of circular look. That it looks like it's kind of tucked in. Now let's see. Alrighty, um, we're getting to the uh, third abdominal segment here. Now you can see that these segments are actually growing rather than shrinking. Um, so starting from here, instead of making it smaller, we are going to start it tucked in, but we're going to almost kind of widen it out a little bit. We're going to make it fan, but we still want it to come and angle backwards until our middle line and then go down. like this. All right, so that is one, two, three. The next one is four. One, two, three, four. The next one is five, and five is the last one that we can see on our screen. So I'm going to be moving this over a little bit. All right, so now we can see this one starting here is two, two, three, four. This one is five. Five is the last one before the weird ovipositor starts, I believe. All right, so we're going to go one more time. 
I guess I can give my sketch a boost just a little bit so that you can see. Um, so I start just a little bit underneath. I fan up a little bit and then I'm coming down to that center line that we had pre-decided and then making sure that it keeps with this arch something along those lines. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. Now we're going into six. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and re, I'm gonna re-angle our wasp here a little bit. I wanna see more of the bottom. Yeah, like this. I forgot what segment it is, so I'm going to have to do this really quick. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so... Um, this segment right here is segment five, and then we're moving back over to segment six. Now, segment six starts to get funky, it starts to get smaller, and then segment, um, seven is angled tiny, and eight is that little triangle. So, let's see. Six. So that's where our kind of lateral line just dissipates and that after, oh, you need, you need my sketch. Um, so that's where our lateral line kind of dissipates and then the rest of our stuff is coming up towards in this direction. And actually I might leave that there. That's nice. Okay. All right. So seven comes up like this. And then eight is like that. And now we have to add our ovipositor. That is our egg laying device. OV um, stands for egg and posit, like to deposit, to lay. Ovipositor. <coughs> now I do need my ovipositor to run along this line here. So I'm going to erase this friend that I had lightly sketched. And it's more going to come like this. And I'm going to zoom in on the ovipositor so that we can see some more of this. Let's see. Oh, I missed a little bit of chat. I think the pre-treatment would be to encase your entire body in latex. Huh. 
Nice sort of shingle effect of all those overlapping segments. Yes, exactly. So ideally, a lot of times in a lot of times in wasps, those segments all overlap really nicely, um, and there are some insects that will even take advantage of that and live in between the segments of wasp um, abdominal segments. Now you'll notice that our ovipositor kind of splits at the end. It's actually three pieces. Um, there is the actual egg laying device in the, well there's an actual tube that lays the egg in the center, but then you have a sheath that is two pieces that surround it and that protect it. So sometimes when you have ichneumonids, especially when you have really big ichneumonids um, and they pass, you end up having the ovipositor kind of open up sometimes and then you can see all of the different parts. Um, but this one just kind of divides this way. So we're going to sketch it just the way that we see it. But um, keep in mind that it, it does split into three. Uh, just like a, um, just like, honestly, just like the mouth part of a true bug, um, where they have those piercing and sucking mouth parts and they can when they pierce their tube in the center is for drinking and then it has the two pieces on the outside that are the sheath that help protect it and help pierce. That's the same thing with our ichneumon here. And that, my friends, is our Ichneumon wasp for today. It's so pretty. This one I'm definitely going to be putting in the book. I'm pretty happy with this one. I was afraid that that abdomen wasn't going to come out right, but I'm pretty happy with it. Like the shingles of the roofs, exactly. It's a serious business ovipositor. That's what I was thinking. And I'm not sure exactly what it's laying its eggs into. Um, there are, like, the giant ichneumonids will lay their eggs um, into grubs that are wood boring. So they have the ability to sense where there is a tree grub. Um, and their ovipositor will actually drill into the wood and will lay an egg inside of a grub inside of a tree. And I just think that that is so amazing because they have to be able to sense and know exactly where the grub is so that they can drill their ovipositor into the tree and lay their eggs. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of like when you're drawing blood because, and, and even um, some people, even some phlebotomists have a hard time kind of finding the vein. Can you imagine trying to be a wasp, trying to drill your uh, ovipositor into, a, into wood to hit the grub on the other side where you can't see it? But I do believe that they like, I think that they use their sense of hearing and they can actually hear the grub chewing on the wood or maybe they can feel the vibration of the chewing on the wood and that's how they find them. You found a, an emperor scorpion with a broken terrarium. Oh, that's so sad. I hope that you saved it. Yes! Okay, cool. I'm so happy that you got to see the egg laying part separate from the sheath. Um, that's a pretty cool thing to see when you're looking at our, in the, when you're looking at our ichneumonids. And they tap all over with their legs and antenna. I wonder if they're sensing some type of chemical then. Oh, so... It had a broken terrarium, but it was still kind of living in it. It was using its terrarium as a home, kind of going back and forth. That's wild. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we've got our wasp ball figured out. Um, we have... Yeah, the big characteristics for ichneumons are the horse head. 
inside of the wing venation. That's really all you need to know with them. Um, and then when you get down into the species, it's pretty much impossible. But I believe that we probably could identify this one down to genus with, um, like, a really good picture and put on the iNaturalist. Um, but... I just have not yet done that. We are closing in on it being fall slash winter, and so I might be picking up the Guess That Bug again where I take uh, microscope pictures and post them on Instagram. I think that'll be a lot of fun. All right, so that is our ignomonid. Yay! Um, I am happy that we got to go ahead and look at it. I'm going to zoom out our zoom out our friend here so that we get one last view of its of it in its entirety. When the giant ichneumonid rolls up its ovipositor, it pulls inside the abdomen and the abdomen actually stretches out around the rolled up ovipositor. Whoa! See, I feel like I've watched it, but I probably, like, I saw it in passing, but I didn't sit and actually watch it over the course of time. So that's definitely something that maybe the next time I see it, I will have to, like, I'll have to stop and slow down and maybe even journal it. I think that would be cool. What is it about insects being able to color coordinate so well? What do you mean? Uh, um, you mean like the orange and the black? I'm not sure. I got nothing for you on that one. I do know that the, I kind of do love that the every, at the end of every abdominal segment, there's that little yellow stripe. That makes me happy. I just went in and added these little soft lines so that I can remember that there's another color there. I might even, when I'm sketching, when I'm doing the ink outline, I might even add those into the sketch. Yeah, that'll make it look really nice. That also is going to, that also is going to really um, show off the fact that it's kind of arching towards us and it shows that lateral line really well. I love that. Oh, very cool. The golden honey color and the black is lovely. I'd have to totally agree. Yep, you're right. It almost looks like it's ready to go to a wedding. Like, it's all dressed up for tuxedo time. All right, so that is October 30th. Um, that is October 30th. We have been live streaming for 30 days in a row. How crazy is that? Um, we are only have one day left of Inverttober, and I promised you, ladies and gentlemen, that we would do a collection tour. So tomorrow, and uh, Monday at 10 p.m., we are going to be pulling out my insect drawers. You're going to be able to see what they look like in real time. Um, we're going to look at all of the different specimens I have. We'll probably pick and choose different ones to tell stories about. I don't think I'll be able to tell a story about every single one because there are hundreds of bugs, but um, I definitely can go ahead and show you some of my favorites, and you guys can even pick and choose which ones um, you're interested in hearing about or which ones you think are going um, you, you find interesting, and we can talk about those ones. Um, Yay! And major props to consistently celebrating Invertober. I appreciate it. It has been a little, it has been a long month, I'll admit. But you know what? It's been so much fun, too. And I have gotten so much done. Um, there is a part of me that really wants to continue doing once a week tar um, tarot symbology and those types of things. Because that, um, every Tuesday, we were getting a good number of people. And we were, um... 
the tarot and the tarot was a lot of fun to talk about. So, um, we might, I, I might be considering keeping, um, tarot around for a while. Isn't hymenoptera supposed to be in reference to weddings? I remember the term hymen originally being a term related to a wedding. I am not sure. I thought that hymen meant, um... Membrane. I thought that uh, that hymen meant membrane and that the op the terra p t e r a meant wings. So I thought that when we were talking about hymenoptera, we were saying that they had um membranous wings. I predict I will try to take notes on ones I'd like to sketch, but we'll just end up wanting to sketch all of them. I think that that's really funny. So with, yeah, with our insect, um, with our collection tour, you know, I do want, but I please take notes of which ones that you want to sketch. Um, admittedly, I have not been keeping track of which one we've sketched and which ones we've not sketched. Um, so I would actually have to go back and look through, but if there are ones that you see and you're like, yes, I definitely want to sketch that, please write it down because then, um, when I, when we get there on Thursday or on Sunday and I go, hey, what bug do you guys want to sketch? At least you've seen the collection once and that'll be nice. Um... Yay, more Tarot Tuesday. Love Tarot Tuesday. Yeah. All right. So that sounds like a, that, that honestly, that sounds like a plan. I am probably going to be keeping Tarot around. I also get a lot of views from those. We got like a good number of people that were all hanging out all at the same time to listen about, let's listen to and about Tarot. So, um, you know, where it isn't a hard science, right? Like it's a, I'm a scientist and entomologist. It's something that I, that I enjoy and am passionate about also. So it's cool when like two different loves kind of mold and merge like that. Yes, take notes about which ones we want to sketch. That is our goal. So when we're looking at our insect collection and doing our collection tour, writing down which ones you want to sketch or even like what types of insects you want to be leaning towards because, you know, there are a whole bunch of them. All right. Um, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I had a lot of fun. Let's go over to our closer. So, um, we've been celebrating Invertober, and technically, it just broke midnight where I am, so it is the October 31st, but we will be live streaming one more time tomorrow for our collection tour. I also do all types of other things, like teach on OutSchool. That's a platform where I can teach students ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, and older, um, all about insects. We do weekly insect studies, we do illustration, um, we do collection management, all of that type of stuff, and you can find it here. Um, you, the description box below actually has a link to my OutSchool page, and if you follow it, you get $20 um, towards your first handful of classes. Now, that is just a reminder to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you have not already, um, there is a little notification bell over to the left next to the subscribe button, and that will notify you every time that I go live. So if you are curious and you'd like to do that, go ahead and um, check that out. Um, that right there is where you have the ability to tip me if you wanted to send me um, if you wanted to send me a tip and um, you can go ahead and find it there at that QR code or you can find it in the description box below. There's a link where it'll direct you to my PayPal. I super duper duper appreciate it and I know there are a uh, good number of you that regularly donate and I just want to always 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 say thank you it means the world to me and you guys are the reason that I am still doing this <laughs> yeah so I love it um, Facebook and Instagram um, I am at Insectopia 2015 if you're looking for me and you can't find me it might be because you need to add the numbers All right.
thank you for the lovely evening, Avea and Susan. See you all later. Super happy, happy, happy Halloween. Um, and I will see you tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Happy Halloween.